Yes. And is it fair to say you've known her since you started for B BSS in 2004? Not since 2004. When I went to work in the South in 2014 is when I got to know her, met her. But I knew of her name because I worked at Intake where we gave reports to workers and sent emails. So I knew of her, but not knew of her. And you started working for Department of Family Services in 2004? Yeah. And what do you do as a family services supervisor? I currently lead a team of investigators for the four and under specialized unit. And what kind of duties do you do leading the investigators? Review reports received, assign the request to investigators, staff cases with investigators, staff if they, all, if they call for the present danger, present danger assessments, uh, staff removals. Staff? Staff case closures. And when you were in the South Unit from September of 2014 to December of 2015, did you have a supervisor? I did, a manager. And who was your manager? Lisa McKay. Did you ever supervise Ms. Stewart? No. And so these UNB case notes, what are they? What's their purpose? It's to document activities such as if you call somebody, if you file a referral to service for a family, if you, anybody that you speak with regarding the case, you document in a case note. And why is this important to document what's going on with the case? It's essential to knowing what transpired during the life of a case. And is there a certain, does BFS have a policy as to what information needs to be placed in the case notes? I don't know if there are specifics as to what you have to place in the case notes. There's a specific policy as to who you need to see during your course of an investigation. Was there, were you ever trained when you were coming through the process as an investigator as to what types of information you should put in the case notes? So, but I don't know that there was a specific training that I went through that said, when you do a child contact, you make sure you put X, Y, Z in the note. I don't believe there's such a thing. Are you familiar with the term present danger plan? A present danger plan is implemented if present danger has been identified. And how is present danger identified? If upon an initial response or at any time during the case, if you respond and you find a child is unsafe, it's considered present danger. If there is a significant, clearly observable indicators that a child is unsafe and you need to take action. And who makes the decision to put the present danger plan in place? Generally, the investigator will identify present danger. They'll call a supervisor and advise the supervisor of what the concern is. They'll work with the family to develop the plan and then ultimately get staff with the supervisor to see if it's sufficient. And if a plan is not being followed, what happens? It would be staff to determine what adjustments potentially would need to be made to that plan. Or if the plan is unsuccessful, what other options are available to make the plan successful. What's a CFP? Child and family team meeting. And what's the purpose of a CFP? Many purposes, depending on the needs of the case, but it's generally getting a team together to staff where the case is at and the needs of the case, the strengths of the family, the needs of the family, the going over the details of the case with a group depending on who's meeting in that meeting. Okay, and is it fair to say that if there's a present danger plan, there has to be a present danger assessment? Correct. And why do you use Boys Town? They have a parenting program. It's an in, it's in home where its staff of their team goes into the home one or two days a week to work with the family hands-on, enhancing their parenting skills. 
They also refer families to different community resources that the family may need. What do you mean community resources? Like what kind of things? Like a family resource center, if they're needing help paying their electric bill or to a food bank, if they need food, different resources that are available within the community. Could it assist with rent as well? They refer them to agencies that would potentially be able to help there. In 2000, during the time frame of this case, so the end of 2014, beginning of 2015, was DFS using Mojave Mental Health? As a safety service provider, yes. What services did they provide? They were one of the agencies that was contacting with the department, or I'm sorry, contracting with the department to provide safety services, meaning individuals that could go to the home and at various points of the day, depending on when the danger was identified, to check in on the family, have eyes in the home at various points throughout the day. Now, looking at January 6th of 2015, and at 8 a.m., there's an entry in the note that says Rodriguez Staffing, parentheses Georgina, and parentheses semicolon South. What is this regarding? What page are you on, Bill? 51. Sorry. Okay. The note in it says Mojave, which makes me believe we were staffing it for Mojave Safety Services to potentially be involved with the family. Who scheduled this meeting on January 6th? I believe it would have been me and Georgina since I put it on my calendar. Was it your decision to schedule the meeting? I believe Georgina would have asked for it. Did you meet with Ms. Stewart on January 6th? I don't know. But you would agree that you did not put any case note in for January 6th around 8 a.m.? Yes. What would lead you to believe there was a representative from both Boys Town and Mojave Mental Health Safety Services at the CFC? Yes. I think it's would that lead you to believe. Oh, would that lead you to believe? Okay, so we need to retake. <laughs> would that lead you to believe there was a representative from both Boys Town and Mojave Mental Health Safety Services at the CFC? Yes. Case staffing regarding safety services in the home at DFS South Office. Present was DFS in home specialist, this specialist, Mojave Mental Health, Supervisor Mary Atterbury, Sharon Savage, and Clint Holder. Is there something we could look at to identify who that in home specialist would be? Uh, given that the given the fact that the case was never formally transferred to a worker, how it played out later, I don't know that there is. Because in Unity, only a case is transferred, then it's assigned to an in-home specialist. Or because in Unity, once a case is transferred, then it's assigned to an in-home specialist. This makes me believe that we were trying to get it to an in-home specialist, so they, sat on, so they sat in on this meeting, but it was never formally assigned. And then do we know who from Mojave Mental Health was present? I do not. Who is Sharon Savage? She's a manager with the department. Do you know why she said in this meeting? At the time, she was managing SIP's implementation, implementation, and she was sitting in the meeting with our consultant, Clint Holder, when we were staffing cases for basically the team would come together, staff what's going on with the case. Clint is part of the action team that was training us. He's like the director of that agency or somebody in that agency. So given the SIPs was still implementation stages, it was still in the implementation stages, first years, we would consult with the team that would be training us. And she was the lead of that implementation. And do you know why you were the supervisor in this 2 o'clock meeting? 
because the other two supervisors weren't there that day. Did you make the decision that out-of-home placement for the children needed to happen? In a team consensus, yes. So does the final decision come from the supervisor? Yes. And why did you believe that an out-of-home placement was necessary? Because at the time, the family didn't have adequate resources to mitigate the, the safe, identified safety concerns. On January 7th of 2015, what were the safety concerns? The safety concerns were the mother's ongoing mental health, alcohol and drug abuse, and the father's blatant lack of protective custody capacities. And why did you find him to have a blatant protective capacity? Because he was aware of the concerns and yet did nothing to protect his children. When Mr. Eggleston was on the present danger plan, When Mr. Eggleston was on the present danger plan, did you have concerns with that? Yes. Why? Because we don't put parents on a present danger plan if they're part of that of the concern. And your concern is based off of what about Mr. Eggleston? The fact that he was aware of the concerns yet chose to take no action to protect his children. So you had an allegation, but you didn't have any actual proof that Mr. Eggleston was abusing substances. Is that fair? That's fair. Did you ever suggest to Mr. Eggleston that he move out of the home? I believe that was one of the options. Another option was, could you put the kids in daycare? Various alternatives were suggested to him in an attempt to keep the kids in the home and or and or if he would have left the home with the kids but he wasn't articulating that he understood the concerns for the mother and so no concerns with leaving the children in her care what, what are other options do you believe were given to mr eggleston to have either him leave the home or laura leave the home uh, is it fair to say that since you never really spoke to anybody that your involvement was limited with this family? Very limited. And most of your information was, was relayed to you by Georgina Stewart? Correct. Who is the investigator in the case? Yes. So if one of the parents, either Steve or Laura, would have left the house, do you think this case would have been different? If one of them had left the house, I feel we potentially, some of the resources we were trying to put in with an in-home case could have been more viable. And then you said that there weren't adequate resources to mitigate those safety concerns. So what adequate resources were you referring to? With the present danger plan, we had two adult daughters in the home full time to supervise the mother and to ensure that the father wasn't leaving the children unattended in her care while he was working. We're losing those on January 6th or 7th when these girls were leaving to go back to Illinois. So Boys Town only visits the home once or twice a week. Mojave Mental Health only visits the home once or twice a week. Sporadic drop-in for a max of an hour. That wasn't concluded sufficient enough to ensure, given that the dad reports he works 12 to 15 hours a day, to ensure that mom isn't alone with these children. So it was ultimately your decision to, that out-of-home placement was necessary, fair? It was an ultimate decision that what we had at that given time as far as what we were trying to work with for an in-home plan was insufficient and if we can't work in a, an in-home plan then yes an out-of-home plan is the last resort and that was based on Ms. Stewart providing you information yes whose recommendation was the out-of-home placement when uh, it would have been made at the time that we were in the meeting with Clint and Sharon when we staff what all the concerns are what all information we're, we've gathered from the family and collaterals at this point, what all resources we have. So in that, the meeting, it was determined collaboratively that an in-home plan that we were trying to work and have been trying to work isn't going to mitigate the danger threats. And at any point during that meeting, did Ms. Stewart disagree with that? No. And on January 7th, was that Elder Rodriguez's sister still present in Nevada? I don't know. I, I would believe so. I know that they were. there was a plan for them to leave. Both of them were. And I know, I know we're leaving around that time frame. 
And that's why all the meetings started happening to see decisions had to be made of what that would look like with them not in the home. Do you know if DFS ever relayed the fact that they could not formulate a safety plan for Steve? That would have been when she went out there on the 7th. Uh, she would have relayed to them that what we're currently, since she could have reiterated, she should have reiterated to them that the current plan we're working on isn't working and reached out to them to see, do they have any other resources or another plan? Do you have any reason to believe that she in fact did that? I don't know why Stuart wouldn't have done that. So while you're talking to the family about options, do you have the officers there for a peaceful standby? Yes. When you had your staff meeting on January 6th, were there discussions of guardianship? Not that I'm aware of. Do you know how guardianship came into play in this case? I don't know who generalized the idea, but I believe that became part of the equation when she went out on the 7th and the family proposed that. So it's your understanding that the family proposed the guardianship? Yes. Do you know where the family would have gotten the guardianship forms from? I don't know. Would you agree that this was supposed to be a temporary guardianship? Yes. Is there forms that DFS uses for temporary guardianship? No. Did you approve a guardianship happening? No. Does a guardianship need to be approved by a supervisor? No. So at, at that point, if they told Laura she was leaving the home, why would the dynamic not have changed at that point? I don't think she was leaving immediately. I think her plan was to ultimately move to Illinois, but it wasn't like, I'm leaving this minute. So, you know, I, I don't know that that was ever offered as an option. She'll leave today. Can we work, some, can we work something? Can we look at what in-home options would look like for just the father? Are you aware that she did leave that day? No, I wasn't aware of that. So somebody could leave the home, and, and what else? somebody could come into the home so if the kids would have been removed where would they have gone at that point we asked if they're at that point they would they were we're removing them uh, we'd ask the family to we'd ask the family if they had any local family friends anybody that they would like or us to consider for placement so generally the children are taken to child haven and whoever they recommend would have to come for a background check. They have to fingerprint for formal placement of the children. So you would have been exploring that option. We can't come up with a plan, we have to remove. Uh, who, who do you have that knows these children, that these children are aware of, that we can place these children with? And she would have gone down that route with them. Why can't you place out of state? You have to do interstate compact. DFS isn't involved in a guardianship, then why is it that they would have asked for an in-home safety check to be done? I can speculate that whoever was reviewing it for closure wanted to ensure that they had a physical house for these children. So we would have, generally, practices that we cross-report to the state. Given there's no concerns we can express regarding, highly likely that they would take it as if the kids are in their care. So potentially, whoever was approving the case just wanted to ensure that they made it there and that the, there was a house available. But the in-home inspection wasn't done prior to the kids going to Illinois. Correct. The primary goal usually is reunification with parents? Oh, always, always. Now, we interchange a lot DFS, CPS. What is the distinction? So CPS is the investigative part of DFS. I just asked you if you followed up on this statement in here that there had been prior domestic violence calls between Laura and Steve. It should have been something that both was asked of the parents and then we can do what's called a CAD, which 
they run call outs to the home, but she could have ran that as well to, to verify that information. Where it says present danger, no records exist, and then pending danger, no records exist. Do you know why it would be marked that way? I don't know, but that's a unity mistake of the fact that it was a B2. Uh, and then when you read the narrative, rationale and pending danger identified. So I don't know what's going on with the unity that it didn't pull that up. Had you looked at any documentation before your staff meeting with Ms. Stewart on January 6th of 2015? No. And so if Ms. Stewart had been your investigator, would you have reviewed the case notes? Yes. Would you have reviewed the present danger plan? Yes. Would you have reviewed the CPS referral summaries? Yes, I would have reviewed everything before case closure. Before the meeting, would I have reviewed? More likely, yes. So if you're the direct supervisor of that worker, then there's a lot more reviewing of actual what notes are done, what's all, what all she's seen, what all she's documented. All of that's being done at the present danger assessment at, at the seven day, 21 day, and 40 day, 40 day closure. Is that all right? Did you get the gist? 